so many different types of people when it comes to breakfast. So no, it's not my usual breakfast. I usually have yogurt, fruits and nuts, but I didn't have time this morning, so I grabbed okay. stuff <laughs> on the go. I'm here with Ambre Soubiron. She's the CEO of Kaiko. And so Kaiko is a, a French company based here in Paris and um, specializes in data and analytics around crypto. And so I uh, want to get a bit of a uh, yeah, bit of background on yourself and also what you guys are doing. So yeah, you, you came into to, to Kaiko. The story of how you, you came to CEO of Kaiko is kind of an interesting one. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about your background and how that came about. Yeah, of course. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, indeed, my uh, background is in traditional finance. I was uh, working for HSBC for about a decade, structuring equity derivatives. So using a lot of data, interested in data, interested in financial markets and money in general. Uh, but I was not kind of from a more startup entrepreneurial background. I got introduced to blockchain back in 2013. Um, started looking at it, investing in it personally, getting more and more interested. Uh, making quite a bit of noise even within the scope of like my, my professional world around blockchain and uh, I met uh, a guy called Pascal He's the current CEO at Ledger. Pascal Gauthier is a former crypto uh, Executive he had just IPO the company on the Nasdaq and had discovered blockchain um, We got in touch back then it was 2014 and he was starting Kaiko uh, And so Kaiko is a market data company in the space of blockchain um, I met him back then, uh, we had a great conversation, we discussed on how we could one day sell market data around cryptocurrencies to financial institutions, but it was way too early, there was no market back then. This was I like 2016, 2017? 2014, <coughs> this oh, was 2014, shit. yeah. Kaiko's been around for longer than people know. Um, and so Pascal founded the company in 2014, uh, I was like having just regular interactions and uh, we had a, a great like discussions around financial markets and market data and blockchain, but nothing formalized at that stage. He started the company, uh, hired an entire engineering team and they built an awesome product which we still use pit bits of today. Uh, however, there was no market. So two years later, late 2016, um, the initial team, I think, started being a bit discouraged, which I can understand knowing how hard it is to run a company. Uh, it must be even harder when you don't have a market yet. Yeah. So everybody kind of got a bit tired and left. And Pascal was also one of the board members of Ledger, and Ledger had grown significantly in those years because it was a more retail-focused market. And so he told me, I'm going to join Ledger, and I'm kind of... Um, pretty much dropping Kaiko uh, because there's no market and it's uh, there's no team anymore. Uh, I need to move on. Mm. At that point, I left HSBC and I invested in Kaiko, acquired a uh, controlling stake of the company and relaunched Kaiko. So we were still leveraging back then on the historical data that Pascal had been collecting over the past years and we had the brand, we had the reputation, which was great. And also when people started needing data in 2017, we already had some inventory and we had a product and we were ready to ship. So it was a double-edged sword being too early and having a product when people needed the product. I think you told me once that basically when, when Pascal wanted to leave, uh, he, he brought you on to sort of get the company into a, in, 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 at a state where he could sell it or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then you, you started just improving, you know, the business and, and re generating revenue and yeah. yeah. So the original reason uh, kind of I started working with Kaiko was uh, we uh, got an offer on the table, uh, which was more kind of an, um, you know, verbal offer that Pascal received one day talking to a, a big company in the crypto space, won't say the name. <coughs> And Pascal told me, if you can get kind of Kaiko back in order, um, you'll get a cut on the sale price. So that's kind of how I started getting involved more on a consulting basis. And then I realized that there's something bigger than just this sale that could happen. And I told Pascal, like, let's not sell it. Let's restart it. And I'm in and I'm keen to reinvest in the company. And so that's how, that's how, that's how it happened. Cool. Yeah, that's a cool story. Uh, so uh, how, what do you guys do? Like, wh what is... Uh, what does a blockchain data and analytics company do? So we're basically connected to um, every single crypto exchange in the world. We're connected to over 100 exchanges. And for every exchange that we cover, we track all the trading related data for every listed instrument. So we cover, I think, something over 30,000 instruments. Um, 
if you ask me a simple question such as what is the price of Bitcoin, it sounds like an easy question. It's actually not uh, an easy question if you what want What is that. the price of Bitcoin? Well, right now, <laughs> good question, actually. <laughs> I don't know. Hope I hope it's higher than I think. Um, but, but basically, it's not an easy question. Price discovery in the crypto markets is purely based on offer and demand. And so yeah. what we do is we're connected to all these trading venues and we track what's called like order book data. Order book data is all the buy orders and all the sell orders. Uh, the combination of all these orders create what we call an order book and represents for every exchange the depth and the structure of the market. Like what, how much volume is there at what different price levels? When you um, look at the intersection of the price curve and the offer curve, you get trading happening and all those transactions, those consecutive transactions, executed trades, is how price discovery is made. And those reflect the actual share, well not share price, token price for those different assets. So the price of Bitcoin is technically nothing less than the last price at which a transaction was executed. Um, and that's the information we provide to different market participants. All the order book data and all the trade data. So you're connected to every exchange, virtually like hundred something. Virtually every exchange and every, and then also collecting all the data from all the trading pairs. Yeah. What, like, how many trading pairs does that represent in total? So that's over thirty thousand different uh, what we call instruments. So, for example, Bitcoin Dollar on Coinbase is one instrument. Bitcoin Dollar on Kraken is a different instrument. So thirty thousand. But like thirty thousand individual uh, unique instruments, which is a specific asset pair on a given exchange. That's massive. It's it's huge. It, and and I, I suppose it's growing too, like very rapidly. Yeah, we add, uh, well, depending on the days, we add from like a dozen to hundreds of new instruments on a daily basis. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of terabytes of data. We've been storing that since 2013. Um, okay, so, so you also, because you also yeah, obviously have historical data. Yeah, so we're basically kind of storing a historical um, ledger so it's not a ledger, a historical database of every single transaction that has been executed over all the different trading venues in the world where people buy and sell crypto assets. And not only executed transactions, but also all the buy orders and all the sell orders without them being executed. And that's what we call the depth of the market and the structure of the market. You can see sometimes where there's like strong like imbalances on one side, on the buy side or on the sell side. This is actually really important uh, information for market participants to know what does the structure of a specific market looks like across mm. different venues w what do people use this data for like who are your clients and, and why are or why are they wanting all this data so we're f like solely b2b we only work with companies um those are either um crypto funds quant funds people that need a lot of historical data to run backtesting to trade um algos these kind of guys so they use us for like live monitoring and real-time trading um, we work with researchers, we work with uh, exchanges, interestingly exchanges, of course they have their own data, but they use us to be able to know how they compare to other exchanges um, because everything is standardized, of course everything is kind of uh, available in one place in the same format. Uh, so we work with exchanges, researchers, um, people such as like the Bitwise guys that are doing uh, research or that are building ETFs, uh, people that are building indices, benchmarks. Uh, we work with all top universities around the world that are um, carrying out research on crypto. Um, market makers, yeah. A anybody that really needs a reliable kind of price infrastructure. And also people who need valuation data, like really reliable valuation data, so that they can value assets that they have either under custody or for providing services such as Ledger. Uh, when you plug in your key on your laptop, it tells you they can read the blockchain, right? They know yeah. your address and they know how many Bitcoins you have, but the app actually tells you how much is it worth in dollars. They need to have a reliable kind of third party source for um, an exchange rate so they can provide to their users. And they cannot be themselves figuring out what's the price of Bitcoin. Right. I mean, uh, because you have all this data, I mean, you provide this data to your to your clients and then you know they'll go and exploit that data. But are, are there things that you extract from the data that uh, like what kind of valuable insights are you extracting from the data that you, you can provide to your customers in addition to just the raw data? Do you have sort of like l layers of analytics on top of the data itself that you also sell or is it so strictly the data? No, so very good question. It's kind of strictly the data in the sense that we don't, you know, we don't have a platform, a terminal, like a UI with fancy charts or whatever. We don't do that at all. However, we create a lot of data derivatives. So for example, like when we have all the buy and sell orders of an order book on a given market, we calculate things such as slippage. Slippage for a given size order, for example, if you ask me what's the slippage on Coinbase for a Bitcoin dollar for a 50K 
dollar order, what we're going to tell you is we're not going to throw the order book at you. We're going to tell you it actually uh, in order for the order book to absorb a 50K order, it will cost you eight bips of the mid price, for example. So those are kind of data sets that we provide. Uh, they're not raw data, but they're not, um, they're, they're kind of actionable data that you can use directly as a consumer, mm. but it's not, it's not raw, but it's not kind of processed either. Mm. Um, then we, we just were launching technically next week a research fact sheet. This is like four pages of data um, charts and, uh, and correlation analysis. It's really like fully um, quantitative only. We don't do any analysis. We don't do any interpretation. We don't try to say, okay, this is why the price went up or down. However, it's going to be four pages of like technical analysis on fundamentals for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. Mm. Um, so so I, I suppose there's, there's probably lots of business opportunities here for you to produce a lot of derivative data uh, and analysis and this sort of thing. Is this just not in sort of like what you want to provide or, or, or are you just, you know? Depending on how the company will grow, we might start like, you know, hiring researchers. For now, it's more data scientists. It's yeah. like we're a very engineering um, focused team for now. And we partner with people that are doing research. Uh, we're going to announce a few uh, partnership with known media companies in the space in the coming month. And the idea is we, we said kind of a level before we're really infrastructure focused. Yeah. So we enable people to do research on our data. Uh, we provide aggregated data, data derivatives, as you mentioned, but we're not like in the analysis um, game yet. Okay. I wonder, like, I'm curious, like some of the technical challenges that exist in connecting with, you know, 100 exchanges and, and you know, pulling uh, 30,000 instruments at this sort of second. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. It's, it's very interesting because technically the data is there. It's available. Like if you're relatively, you know, uh, kind of nerdy, you can connect to an exchange API and start pulling Bitcoin dollar data. Just what is really hard is doing it at scale in a highly reliable fashion. And none of these APIs are standard, I suppose. Exactly. So you must They're have had to build all yeah. the infrastructure to connect to any kind of API yeah. you know, based on, because you know, all of them are structured differently. Absolutely. Every exchange has a different set of API. And there's like one more thing that's really horrible is just even taxonomy. Like there's no standard. Right. I, there's no standard in how you even once you're connected to an exchange API, the like calling the data for Bitcoin dollar is a different kind of name for the crypto ref refer to those assets depending on the exchange. So actually we're 16 in the company and like two thirds of, of the team are engineers. Uh, it's really a very kind of tech company. Um, we have a full um, on, you know, on like rotating organization so that there's alri always somebody who's checking and monitoring that everything is live. Um, we, it's a yeah, full on call organization. And um, and definitely like the the cost of doing that is also why it makes us valuable is that if uh, every crypto fund in the space had to hire a bunch of engineers to do what we do, uh, pay for the server costs and in internalize all of that, it would just be really expensive. So there's also a kind of economy of scale of we have a full team of like engineers working around the clock to deliver a low latency millisecond level precision product for data. Uh, so that you don't have to internalize that, and the out like paying our costs is a fraction of what it would cost um, to any company to build it in house. And are, so, are you have you been able to sort of um, set standards at all? Like, or, or you know, because you're you're talking to all the exchanges, you know, you have the ability to tell the exchanges like, hey, you, you the, this is the data, this is the API standards that everybody should be using. It would make everyone's life easier. Like. You know, you guys, but also other companies doing the same thing. Um, th th those those exchanges, clients that might be using the API, like absolutely. Um, so we're working. We we've launched a working group about six months ago with um, we're a member of this thing called the Object Management Group, and they're a big international nonprofit that is defining standards for right. how you name okay. assets. That's so cool. they could like they have names for like fertilizers, yeah. but they also have this thing called Open Figgy, which is the financial. Um, identify, uh, sorry, financial instruments unique identifier. Uh, we are basically creating a database of unique identifiers for every crypto asset instrument. Um, imagine a world where we start having financial instrument referring to Bitcoin. Like, what is the price of Bitcoin? Again, like it comes back to our question. You have to specify in the contract: Are we leveraging the price of Bitcoin dollar on Coinbase? Are we taking the average daily price of Bitcoin over all places where it's traded? Like, we have to have a way to refer to those financial instruments 
in order to start leveraging them for financial contracts or applications. Mm. So we're uh, on a workshop. We're hoping to deliver by the summer an infrastructure with like a taxonomy um, report for how can we identify uh, in a unique way all those uh, instruments. So I know I know you have to go, but before you do, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, about this conference and um, your involvement with it. So we uh, we love at CC. We've been uh, we've been sponsors for the past three editions. We've uh, hired a bunch of our team members here. Uh, we've met partners. We've done amazing deals. Met customers. And uh, I'm especially kind of involved in this year's edition. I, by, by I, I mean Kaiko. Uh, we've been running a, a VC track. So last year during CC, I was myself fundraising for Kaiko for our seed round. And I realized, well, two things. One thing that I already knew, which is there are a bunch of amazing people building awesome tech and projects and companies that are coming to this conference. But second, there are investors coming. There are investors that are trying to deploy capital in the space and they just there's, there, it's very hard. There's definitely like a bridge that needs to be created between investors and blockchain companies. And I suffered from that last year. I was trying to find VCs at the coffee area, at the swag area, like in the hallway. And like we were like finding each other near the epicenter booth. It was kind of not structured. And so I basically proposed that we run a VC track within the conference where there is a real framework for investors to meet uh, startups that are currently fundraising. So we had 32 companies pitching this year, 27 VCs attending. Uh, it's really like success. Hopefully in a couple of months, I'll be able to say that, you know, X millions were deployed thanks to the track. Yeah, that would be great. But uh, yeah. And so these VCs are coming from where? All over the world. We have some San Francisco, LA, New York, <coughs> Berlin, Zurich, Zug, um, London. Um, there's a few like from Paris, of course, the event being here in France, it's easier for the French VCs to attend. Um, we we'll have a couple of companies from Hong Kong, and uh, we know that there's this coronavirus situation, so we have actually a live stream in place where investors have been connecting from all over the world to just like view the pitch and listen to the uh, to the presentations. And at the end of the track tomorrow night, we'll share everybody's contact details, all the pitch deck to all the investors, vice versa, and hopefully things will happen. Magic will happen then. Cool. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Omar. Thanks.